All right, it's good to be out here. The anticipation backstage is the worst part of getting out here. <laughs> But it's nice to see some faces. I'm Christina, as uh, Caleb said, and I'm on staff here. I'm really excited to be speaking with you all this morning. I um, was in here yesterday just kind of practicing the message and just kind of praying over the sanctuary. And um, so it's nice to get out here and actually see some faces. That's exciting. Um, so I'm going to speak this morning on gifting, calling, and anointing. And we are kind of in between some message series with some things happening. And so I'm fortunate that I got to choose whatever I wanted to actually talk about today. So um, that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, this message is something that um, honestly, it's really just close to my heart because it's a, something that has been a part of my walk with the Lord. Um, not really gonna share my story because I didn't really feel led to, um, but I just wanted you to know that it's something that I've been on a journey with the Lord with and walking out with him. And so it's something that is really um, close to me as I share these things with you. Um, if you were with us on Easter Sunday, um, Caleb uh, actually spoke uh, some from the book of Exodus, and we're going to actually be back in that book today, and we're going to look at the life of Moses as we talk about giftings, callings, and anointings. So when I saw that um, that was the direction last Sunday, I thought, okay, we must be on a good track. We must be on the right track here. So we're going to pick back up in there today. Um, but first, I kind of want to ask you... Um, when I say calling, I don't know exactly what comes to mind, what that invokes in you, but for a moment, I want you to just think back to when you were graduating high school, about uh, 18 or 19 years old. Uh, some of you gotta think further back than other people. So I pause for a second, no. Um, so during that time, right, you were deciding, what am I, what is it that I really want to do with my life? And that can be a really weighty question as an 18 or a 19 year old, right, to ponder and think about. Maybe you went to college, uh, maybe you went to trade school. Um, I don't know, maybe you stepped into motherhood or fatherhood. There were lots of possibilities in front of you of what to do. Um, and maybe today you're fortunate enough that you're in a job or in a career that you love and that you're passionate about, um, but some of you maybe are in a job where it's more of a paycheck and um, that's what it is for you. And so as we talk about calling uh, this morning, I want you to know that wherever the Lord has you at this morning, and I'm gonna you know, speak to a room of people and I hope God gives something specific to each person that you would maybe take something away, maybe not the whole, but something would speak to your heart this morning. Um, but when you, when you think about that and you think about calling and wherever the Lord has you at right now, he has planted you for a reason and your sphere, he's given you a sphere of influence to release for his kingdom. So wherever he has you this morning, he has purpose in where you're at. Um, but I also believe that the Lord has a very specific calling that he puts on our life, things that he's gifted us with, that he grows inside of us, that he equips us for, and that he's called us to release. Um, Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I also wanted to also say this morning that if you're a mother, if you're a father, I'm not really gonna talk into that sphere today, but I want you to know that I believe that being a mom, being a father, that those are some of the highest callings that we can have and that they're really important and they're really valuable and sometimes we can undervalue them. And I wanted to make sure that I, I said that this morning. Um, but we have a specific call and we have a general call. And um, first, I just kind of want to go through some things that no matter what, what specific call you have on your life, these are callings that we have corporately as a body that we all can be participating in. And so I was thinking about this. Uh, this may, list may not be exhaustive, uh, but these are just kind of the things that came to me as I was preparing. And the first one I thought about for our calling is, you know, we're all called to share Christ and we're all called to make disciples, right? That's the Great Commission. And we're all called to share Jesus with those around us. You may not feel that God's called you as an evangelist, but that doesn't mean that you're not still called 
to share your faith with others. I think sometimes the easiest way that we can do that is just by opening up our life and ourself and sharing how God's at work in our life because that's real and that's authentic and I think people are receptive to that. Um, and we're called to make disciples. So as you're growing and as you're being sanctified, there's gonna be someone else that God wants you to kind of take under your wing and pour into them, share with them the things that God's been teaching you and showing you and pour into them. Um, we're all called to use our gifts to serve the body. And so everybody has giftings. You have talents and abilities. And beyond that, if you're in Christ, you also have something called spiritual gifts that God has given you for the good of the body to build one another up. And I believe that sometimes those can actually act as clues along the way of discovering the personal call that God has on your life. So um, they're gonna put up on the screen, I, I kind of put together a little spiritual gift chart that you can just kind of take a look at for a second. Um, but those are a list of the different spiritual gifts. Now, you might look at that list and you might say, oh yeah, I know, this is me, this is me, I've got that one, I got that one. Or you might look at that list and say, I don't have anything. If you're in Christ, if you've received Christ as your savior, you have giftings, you just haven't discovered them yet. They're there, you're just in the process of uncovering them. God doesn't shortchange anybody, he doesn't leave anybody out of that equation. 1 Corinthians 12, seven says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. The third thing I thought about in our corporate calling is that we're called to glorify God, right? We're created to bring him glory and bring him honor. Ephesians 1.14, the spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Number four, we're all called to love God and to love our neighbor, right? The first and second greatest commandments in Matthew 22, 37 to 39. And then the fifth thing I thought about is that in some way, shape or form, I believe that we're all called to take care of the orphans and the widows. James 1, 27 says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. But now your specific calling that God has for you, I believe it's a very personal mission that God equips you for and he grows inside of you to be able to walk that out. Um, I have a monthly Hearing God's Voice class and this last season we've been going through Chris Valentin's book, School of the Prophets. And it's been really great, really good, and we've had a great time. We have really good discussion around this video series that we're watching. But there's this one chapter in the book where Chris Valentin talks about gifting, calling, and anointing. And he specifically talks about it as it relates to the prophetic ministry and the calling of a prophet. But I found that a lot of the things that he shares, I think they can be applicable to really any calling that the Lord has given you. I found a lot of really good nuggets in there. And so I'm gonna share a few things from that book this morning as we go along. But these are some definitions that I want to read you from him. He says that your gift is what gives you your ability. Your calling is what gives you your identity. Now I wanna pause there for a second because I, I believe um, first and foremost, our identity is being a child of God and being rooted in that. Um, but in addition to that, I believe that God has wired us in a certain way. He's wired each person in a certain way that the call that he has on your life is a part of that wiring and a part of how he's created you. And that's why it's also connected in with your identity. And then he says for anointing, the anointing is what gives you your purpose. And I wanna add to that as I think your anointing is also the authority that God gives you to carry out the calling that he has for you. So we're gonna jump into the book of Exodus and we're gonna look at the life of Moses and I'm just gonna kind of give a little snapshot 
of kind of the context of what's happening. And then we're going to primarily be in chapter three, where Moses has that moment with the burning bush. And um, this is a familiar story. So a lot of this will just kind of be review, but it feels right that we should kind of talk about the context before we actually um, get into the rest of it. And so um, what's happening is the Israelites, right? They're in slavery in Egypt. And they got into Egypt because Joseph, Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. He went into Egypt and he had a lot of false accusations against him. He was in prison, but he had a prophetic gift. He had a gift of interpretation. He gained favor. He rose in power and Pharaoh put him second in command. The Lord spoke that there was gonna be a famine. So they start preparing for the famine. Well, then Jacob and his sons come traveling to Egypt because they're hungry and they come looking for food and they end up settling in Egypt. And then many generations, I don't know exactly how many, but generations go by, lots of descendants. And there becomes a new Pharaoh into power. And this Pharaoh does not know anything about Joseph. He doesn't know about his testimony or any of that. And this Pharaoh becomes concerned because the Israelites have become so massive and he's afraid that if there were to be a war that were to break out that Israel would side with Egypt's enemies and that it would be trouble for them and so the Pharaoh decides he wants to do something about this and so he puts slave masters over the Israelites and makes them work really hard and um, puts lots of burdens on them and so it's within that context right that we know that is where Moses comes onto the scene. And I'm gonna read uh, this here, Exodus 2, one to three. Actually, hang on one second, I wanna say one more thing. And so in the midst of that slavery, there's actually been um, a decree from Pharaoh that all the baby boys need to be killed when they're born, that they need to be killed. But the midwives don't listen to this. They don't follow that. And they make up an excuse for why they're not able to do this. They can't get there fast enough in time. And so then the Pharaoh says, okay, all the baby boys need to be thrown into the Nile River. They need to all be thrown in. And so it's within that context, we'll pick up in Exodus 2, 1 to 3. About this time, a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and she gave birth to a son. She saw that he was speci a special baby and she kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and she laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. And we know that what happens is that Pharaoh's daughter, right, discovers this basket and she takes Moses in to be her own son. But I want to pause here for a minute at that line. She saw that he was a special baby and she kept him hidden for three months. And I think that's really interesting because first off, I'll say most mothers in the room here, you would agree that when you have a baby, you think your baby's special, right? Am I right? Some of us brag a little more about our kids than others, but we all tend to think that our babies are special. But I have a feeling that this special that she saw was a little bit more than that. I think she actually had eyes to see the call, maybe not the specifics of the call, but that there was a calling on Moses's life. And um, I think it's interesting because her daughter Miriam, I believe is actually one of the first recorded prophetesses in the Bible. And I think that's interesting because I think sometimes we forget that Moses's mother must have passed down that gifting um, that she had to have carried a prophetic gifting to see that in her son. So Moses grows up in the palace, right? Um, and grows up, he starts to kind of go out, wander out among the Israelites, uh, and he sees how poorly his people are being treated, right? He's grown up in the palace, but he sees the harshness that they are under. And he gets angered by this, and he actually goes and kills one of the Egyptians that are mistreating one of the Israelites. And then he tries to hide it, uh, but word kind of spreads, and there's some, you know, talk going around and he realizes that he hasn't been able to hide it. And so he gets afraid and so he runs off to Midian. 
the thing that I think um, is interesting about that is that, you know, he doesn't know his calling yet at this point in his life but he's bothered. He's bothered by the mistreatment of the Israelites. And before I believe we actually discover the calling that God's given us, long before there's seeds that are being planted and there's stirrings that are happening inside of us. We might not know the big picture yet, but the Lord is already at work inside of us. So the Lord was at work in Moses, this uncomfortableness of man, I've grown up in the palace, but look how the Israelite people are being treated. So that leads us to the main passage that we're gonna look at. If you wanna go to Exodus chapter three, if you're looking it up on your phone, um, I'm gonna read this from the NLT. I, I've kind of jumped around between the NIV and the NLT, so sorry about that. But this one, we're gonna look in the, the NLT. I'm gonna read verses one to 12. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness, and he came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though a bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I've certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, I might be saying that wrong. Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. So there's a series of things that we see in this passage, and um, the thing I actually didn't realize that Caleb shared with me is that this pattern actually repeats itself amongst the calling of the prophets in the Bible. But he said that first, the first thing that happens is there's this divine encounter. We're gonna go through this calling and then objection and reassurance. And I think we're gonna find some things that we can draw from, from this story of our own callings that the Lord has. And so the first, the divine encounter is that God gets Moses' attention with a burning bush and he speaks to him. And Moses removes his sandals and he consecrates his life. And so our callings, they're always birthed out of intimacy with the Lord. And this consecration of this take, you know, taking off his sandals, he's on holy ground. You know, the Lord calls us to set our lives apart, right? To live holy. We may not live perfectly, that's impossible, but to choose to live holy, to cut, to cut off sin in our lives, to choose to turn away from those things and to set our life apart. And the calling part was in verse 10. Now go for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. Now I got a question. When Moses receives this calling, does he jump up and down with excitement because he finally knows what he's created to do? Yes, he's gonna go tell Pharaoh, let the Israelites go, let all your slaves go. No biggie, no, no big deal. No, right? That's not what he does. That seems impossible. Sometimes the callings that God give us seem impossible. We have to rely on him. It's not something that we can actually birth in our own strength and in our own effort, right? 
And so Moses, he protests this. In Exodus 3.11, his first protest, Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And I wanna start there. Um, I believe this who am I question, I believe that that's the identity question that Moses is wrestling with. Lord, who, who am I actually? And before we ever step into our calling, right? We have to be rooted in who we are in Christ, that we're a child of God, that we've been adopted, that we're royalty, that we're a royal priesthood, that we're seated in the heavenly places. We have to be rooted in those things. And so who am I? Who am I? He asked that question. And the Lord assures him, reassures him, I will be with you. And then there's a second protest in verse 13. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and I tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell him? And I really believe that identity is really a twofold thing when we look at that in our life. It's who does God say that I am? But it's also just as important, what do I believe about God, right? Do I believe that he's trustworthy? Because if not, it doesn't really matter what he has to say about me, right? Do I believe that he's good? Do I believe that he has plans to prosper me and not to harm me, to give me a hope in a future? What do I believe about God? What do I believe about the one that I'm following? And the answer that God gave Moses is, I am who I am. He says, I'm Yahweh. And the third protest, the but, but. I, you get that as a, a parent, but. You get tired of hearing the buts. I, I, I do that to the Lord. Does anybody else do that to the Lord? But God, what about this? Like, I don't think you thought about this or, you know, maybe here, but I'm thinking, you know, five steps down. You haven't thought about that yet, have you, God? Like, but, 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 but. Exodus 4.1, but Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they said, the Lord never appeared to you? And I believe here, he's, you know, he's worried about what other people are gonna think, how this is gonna actually flesh out, how this is actually gonna go. When you receive a calling from the Lord, when the Lord begins to speak something to you and begin to show you the things that he's doing in your life and the plans that he has and the good works that he's prepared ahead of time, you know, other people may not recognize that on your life yet. They may not see that in you yet because it's birthed in the secret place. In the secret place, it's you and God, right? So other people aren't necessarily, they're gonna see the fruit of the secret place, but they're not gonna necessarily see all of what's happening in there. And so people may not recognize the call of God on your life right away. But I wanna read this verse, Luke 2, 52, says Jesus grew in wisdom and he grew in stature and in favor with God and all the people. And so as you grow, and as those things grow inside of you, God may share things with you that are for the future. They may not even be for right, the right now, but as those things grow inside of you, you will begin to gain favor, and people will begin to recognize what God has done in your life in the secret place. And this is what the Lord says to his butt in verses two to five. Then the Lord asked him, what is in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and he grabbed it and he turned it back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob really has appeared to you. And I believe this is where the Lord releases his anointing to Moses, right? The anointing, I believe, is the, is the power and the authority to back up the calling that God has on our life. And so God releases that anointing through Moses' staff. 
um, as a sign and as a wonder. Um, this uh, is another definition from Chris Valentin about or a, a statement about anointing from Chris Valentin. He says, the anointing will always be associated with something to do, with a purpose, a divine commissioning, and or a supernatural mission. Protest number four, verse 10. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, O oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. You see M Moses wrestle with his abil ability. And it's interesting too, because he grew up in the palace, so he would have been a very highly educated person, but he wrestles with his actual abilities to do this. And those doubts will come in when you, when you have the things that you're walking out with the Lord, you all know it, you've experienced it, many of you in here have experienced it, those doubts that rise up as you begin to step out in the things that the Lord's asked you to do. And those are the moments, I think, where we claim and we say, well, Lord, when I'm weak, when I feel weak, you're strong, right? So all the better, because your strength actually gets to flow through me now because I feel weak. And you claim that, you claim that scripture, you claim that promise. But uh, Chris Valton also says, you know, a gift is something that we do and it's not something that we are. So our callings are, t are tied to our identity, but our giftings are, are not. There's something that we do, there's not something that we are. So the Lord responds to this to Moses. He says, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak and I will instruct you in what to say. And then lastly, Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. So like, please, God, don't make me do this. You ever feel that way? God, like he's nudging your heart to do something, talk to somebody, go, go, go tell that person how much I love them. Doing some sort of a nudge in your heart. And you're like, God, can you send somebody else? That's uncomfortable. I, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna look weird. I don't wanna step out in that. But God in his gracious mercy and love, he sends Aaron to help Moses out. And he says, all right, Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put my words inside of you, Moses. Then you're gonna tell it to Aaron. Then Aaron is gonna go and tell it to Pharaoh. Is anybody else just like, what? How does that make sense? Cut out the middle man. We don't need Moses anymore. Cut him out of the picture. Like, how does that make sense? But God is so committed to the calling that he has on your life. He's committed to it. And he's cheering for you and rooting you on in it. And he loves you. And he's not gonna just let you get off that easy, is he? He's not gonna let you get off that easy. This is another quote from uh, School of the Prophets. And this, again, this you're gonna hear uh, it talk about a prophetic gifting, but I want you to listen. I think this is very applicable to many different callings. It says, unlike just the gift of prophecy, so unlike just having a gift, when you have the calling of a prophet or prophet, prophetess, that calling on people's lives, it affects the way they think, the way they approach life, their inner world, and even the way that they feel. This call can be on a person's life from birth or it can come later on when they are born again. Or they may not actually receive this call until many years after they receive Christ. And so again, I, I thought that was helpful to share because I think our callings again are so wired into how God's created us. Sometimes you might even not realize it. Sometimes it's like, maybe it's just second nature to you. You don't realize how that it's just like, it's right there. So I wanna go on with some thoughts of, okay, we've looked at Moses, we've looked at how God gives him this calling and his response and the things that are going on. But beyond that, how do I discover the calling that's on my life? Maybe, maybe you're already walking it out. Maybe you're already in the fruit of that. Um, and God gives us many things in many seasons. Uh, but here's some specific, specific things that I thought might be helpful. Um, Again, encounter God. 
the burning bush moment, encounter him, experience his healing work in your life, I really believe that your healing a lot of times leads you into your anointing. Um, and I love the verse, Romans 8, 28, that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And uh, a lot of times, you know, when you've overcome something in your life, you start to have this burden and this passion and this desire to help other people be overcomers in that area. And I think I've seen many people step into their personal callings through that. Now, trying to make sense of that, does that mean that God led them through that trial? Does that mean that that addiction or that abuse or whatever that was, was from the Lord? No, but the thing I love about it is that God is so much infinitely bigger that I just feel like it's that like punch to the devil of like the devil tries to ruin everything, but God is so much bigger and he can work and bring healing in any type of situation or circumstance. He can bring freedom and he can use you to help release freedom to other people as you're an overcomer. If you're walking with God, then you're not gonna miss it. I think sometimes, sometimes there's like a hyper focus on what's my calling, what's my calling, what's my calling? I've seen this in my life. And then you're like scared, like, God, I'm, I'm, what if I don't actually find it? What if I miss it? And it's, you know, it's just like the Lord just like, relax, just walk with me. Like I'm planting seeds, I'm doing things in your heart, I'm healing things, I'm stirring things up. Just keep walking with me and you're not gonna miss what I'm doing. You're not gonna miss it. Another phrase I wanted to say is start pedaling. And this is kind of like a picture that I've gotten of like, you know, for a bike to start moving, you have to get on it and you have to put your feet to the pedals to get going. Sometimes I think you have to just start serving somewhere and start doing some things to actually figure out what brings me to life. Like what actually, what actually excites me? What energizes me? And you're starting to get closer to finding the things that um, have meaning that are, you've been created to do, those things that just release life from you. Again, the gifts that you are given, I believe that they can be like clues to your calling. They're not necessarily, they're not your calling, but they can give you clues to how God's equipping you for the things that he's calling you to do. Pay attention to the threads that are in your life, even back to childhood. What gifts, talents, passions have been present in your life since the time you were young? Ask someone who would remember or help you get vision for it. What has been there all along and maybe you just have never seen it? If you are not passionate about it, it's probably not your calling. It's, your calling is a thing that you would do even if you didn't get paid to do it. It's really awesome when our jobs and our careers are the, the calling that we have, right? That we can get paid to do it. It's amazing when those things line up, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's not feasible. Even Paul, you know, he had a season of tent making to provide, right, for his ministry for his preaching. And so they may not always they may not always line up, but that's okay. Your calling is a thing that you're like, I would do, I would give my time to this even if nobody ever paid me a dime to do it. And then lastly, where in your life have you just met a lot of resistance? I wanna read this quote from somebody named Katie Luce, who she's a part of Global Awakening and she has a healing ministry. And um, what she said really struck me. She said, when someone releases to God the lie that their voice does not matter, I'm most confident that God has called them in some capacity to be a voice. When someone gives to God the fear of friendships, I wonder if they're anointed to foster and nurture community. Individuals who have wrestled with fear often have a call of courage on their life. The enemy works very strategically in our lives to shut down our purpose through specific emotional pains and interruptions. And what I would say to that is, you know, the enemy, he just really doesn't fight fair. He's really not a fair fighter. And so most likely you've had some sort of resistance in your life to the thing that's, that God's called you to do. 
And it requires an actual spiritual battle to birth the calling that he has on your life because the enemy doesn't want that. He knows that when you walk in your calling and you consecrate your life and the anointing of God, the power of God backs up that calling, the kingdom of God begins to advance. And he doesn't want that. And so you've probably met resistance around the area of your calling. John 10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give them life and give it abundantly. And I also want to read Ephesians 6, 12. We know our struggle's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so we have to know what the voice of God sounds like, and we have to tune into that voice, and we have to stop letting the devil have airtime in our mind, right? We have to stop listening to what he has to say and tune into what the Lord has to say about us. He's gifted you, right? Where he's given you talents and abilities and he's called you. And there's work to be done for his kingdom. So in closing, I'm gonna just go ahead and just close us out with a prayer this morning. So if you'll bow your heads with me, Father, I just thank you for this time to be together. God, I thank you for the callings that are all accumulated in this room, God, the ones that are being lived out, the ones that are seedlings in process, God, um, just all of those, Father, whatever, whatever moment these people are at, Lord Jesus, I just thank you. Just It excites me, God, to think about how many powerful, powerful things are being birthed from this room of people, God. And so I thank you. Lord, I pray strengthening over each and every person in this auditorium today, God, that where the enemy has been trying to knock them down and to tear them down, God, I just right now wanna agree with them, God, just for the silencing of the voice of the enemy over their life, God, that your voice would be the loudest voice that they hear in Jesus' name, God, that they would know how much you love them, that you're pleased with them, Father, that you're proud of them, God, that they would just hear from you this morning, Lord Jesus. And God, I just um, pray your strength over them, God, your supernatural strengthening, Jesus. And I just pray that in the right timing, Father, you'd begin to open up eyes, God, to the things that you're doing, the callings that you have. And we just thank you for all of the fruit that's happening and all of the fruit that's gonna come. And I just ask your just protection, God, your angelic protection over each and every person in this sanctuary in Jesus' name. We thank you, God. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And I just wanna invite you, as always, we will have our ministry team coming forward and we love to pray with you. So if there's something you'd like prayer about this morning, please uh, feel free to come up and get prayer and enjoy your Sunday. I hope it's sunnier out today than it's been all week. So, <laughs> bye.